David Leslie Nash, United States Army, Vietnam. I interviewed Dave right here in my home. It was December 22nd, 2007, and uh, he was in his early 60s at that time. He passed away, sadly, 2021 at the age of 80. But he tells his story of Vietnam, folks, like all the other stories, through his eyes and ears. He was drafted at age 25, entered military police academy in the Army, became a military policeman, earned the rank of sergeant as a military policeman, went to Germany and decided to fly helicopters. So he went to his training at Fort Rutgers and other, uh, other bases and became a Cobra helicopter pilot in Vietnam. He tells some good stories, folks, and his perspective from the air as another one of my chief warrant officer too. He was a chief warrant officer too in Vietnam. And, um, but he flew gunships, he flew in the Ashall Valley, which is the Ho Chi Minh Trail and a number of combat assault missions. And uh, he tells it the way he can only tell it. Dave's a great guy, he was a great guy. He's a musician, his brother and Bill and him were in a gospel group for many years, before the military, after the military, up to the age, up to when he passed away. And he was involved with his brother's ministry, um, ministering to kids. Just a great ministry, and uh, I miss I miss Dave, and I miss working with Bill too. I'm going to show a song after this introduction um, that Bill Nash wrote for my work, "Lest They Be Forgotten." It was done in Nashville. I produced the session in 2005 in Nashville with some great musicians, and I want to I want to share that song with you. That's Dave's brother, Bill, after this short introduction, and he wrote a song for my documentary series, "Lest They Be Forgotten." So I hope that blesses you and touches you, but. I want to thank Michael and Darlene Sarofsky over in Denver. Thank you guys again for helping support the stories that I've recorded over the years. Michael, I love you, brother. Appreciate you so much. Thank you for stepping forward and helping me share these stories with all generations. And uh, it's great working with you. And, and thank you for all your love and support. It's, it's, it's totally awesome, brother. Okay. Folks, that's it. Let's listen to Dave Nash tell Vietnam. I want to did mention he, he received a Purple Heart. Six months in country, he landed hard, crashed in a helicopter and broke his back, was medevaced, spent a lot of time in Sam, Fort Sam Houston in Texas and received an honorable discharge with a Purple Heart. And, um, but he's a wounded combat veteran and just, again, I, I, one of my heroes, one of my heroes. And uh, he was a great godly man, loved the Lord. And I know we'll be seeing him again someday soon. So enjoy Dave's story, folks. Thank you for subscribing to this channel. And I will talk to you on another broadcast. God bless you. I got something else to tell you too. This is on the subject of Larry Capetto. Uh, it, you know what, for these guys to put their lives on the line, I, I've come close to that in the military. It, I mean, when I say that, my brother is the one that did that. And I, give, I give all the credit where it's due. But for somebody like Larry Capetto to do this, for those that have done that, it, the appreciation is great. And I appreciate you, Larry, for I'm looking right in your camera saying, I appreciate you having the heart for that. I know God dropped this in your lap to do. And I know you've done it out of your own back pocket and it's been lean at times, but it's going to get good. Because God knows and sees your sacrifice and your, your contribution to the lives of these men. And it's fulfilling to their families to know this was not in vain. Freedom is not free. And you're getting it on camera what it cost. There you go. Their 
sacrifice to never forget. They paid freedom's price. What greater love than for someone to lay down their life, give up all their tomorrows, protecting you and I. Never forget. Never forget. We gotta keep remembering, lest they be forgotten. I got drafted in the last part of 1965 and then went into service in January of 1966. 66. And did you go to Fort Rutgers to your basic training or what did you do your basic training at? Basic training was in uh, Louisiana at uh, Fort Polk, okay. Leesville. And uh, then I went through the Military Police Academy at Fort Gordon, Georgia and was stationed in Germany for a couple of years. And while in Germany, I got to talking to uh, some of the lifers, and I was 26 years old when I got drafted. I was just turned 25, so I, another year and they wouldn't have got me at all. And uh, we decided, several of us put in for flight school because we didn't want to go through our military careers as enlisted men or NCOs. There's nothing wrong with NCOs, we just wanted something more. And uh, we put in for flight school. We figured that'd be the cheapest way to get a commission or a warrant. And they were all turned down and I was accepted. So in December of 68, I came back to the United States and went through uh, primary helicopter training at Fort Walters, Texas. And then in June or July, I went to Fort Rucker for the advanced and graduated and then went to Cobra, transitioned in December of that year. And then later on, I think March 3rd, I arrived in Vietnam, March 3rd, 1970. Tell me about the first time you went to Vietnam, what you experienced. Did you get off the plane or what do you remember about the country? Uh, I remember getting off the plane. We had, uh, they had the world charter, I think, World Airways or something like that. It was a military charter. And during the long flight, of course, we got rather well acquainted with the stewardesses. And they were cute. 
And uh, when we got to Vietnam, they opened the front doors, and then a few minutes later, they opened the back doors. Well, we were flying in the back of the airplane. So when we went to leave, I asked the stewardess, I said, can I kiss you? And she said, why? And I said, you may be the last American girl I get to kiss. So she put her cheek up, and I turned and kissed her full on the mouth. And as I went out the door, I heard the guy behind me say, can I kiss you? <laughs> and it wasn't long before the line was just going back through the airplane like that. A little bit of jocularity. But we arrived at Tonsonute Air Base and spent a zero week there getting oriented and getting issued clothes. They took all our civilian clothes and all our money. We were, it was illegal to have American money over there, the black market thing. Spent a week there and then waited on our assignment. And a couple of the guys I'd gone through flight school with, I knew and we were assigned to the 101st Airborne up in i -Corps, the northern part of Vietnam. And uh, it took us a while to get up there, just from the military transport thing. We weren't a priority shipment. Mm -hmm. So then uh, after we got to the 101st, they had a thing called CERTS, Screaming Eagle Replacement Training. And for a week, we was out in the boonies in one of their secure fire bases that was back from the Ashaw Valley. And we learned local customs, what we couldn't turn our flight jackets inside out because the international orange was a holy color to the Vietnamese. So uh, learning that and their uh, <clears throat> dietary, the rice, you know, what, are, what all they eat. And uh, unfortunately, there was a couple of courses in there about what to do if you do get captured. And they, they scared you pretty bad. <laughs> and they had some, uh, they called them Kit Carson Scouts. These were North Vietnamese or Viet Cong that had come and turned themselves in along with their pamphlet and their rifle, and they could get amnesty. And they retrained them to lead American troops back through whatever operational area they had been in. And that, my first confrontation with one of the Kit Carson scouts, he was a professional fighter, and I wasn't. I was just a civilian wearing, you know, learned how to do it. And I saw in his eyes, in that man's eyes, I saw that war was, or the conflict he was in, he'd been in since birth. I just landed in country a week before. But I, I just got a partial feeling for, I guess, the local flora and fauna of the situation. And he was probably in a new environment too because he just turned himself in. There was about six or eight of them. And they run these, uh, we'd play like we was going out and attacking a, a bunker system or something and they would be the aggressors. Kit Carson Scouts, that had to be a well thought out program. I guess Kit Carson here in the United States, you know, when he was a scout, he lived with the Indians a lot. Is that right? And that's why they call these guys Kit Carson Scouts. So you were in Vietnam a whole year, correct? No, sir. No? I got there on March the 3rd. April the 3rd, we had our first uh, confrontation, I guess, with the enemy. We got attacked. And we were stationed at Camp Eagle, which had been built between Way and the Ashaw Valley. As a Tet 68 was really apparently really bad. And they were expecting to stop a North Vietnamese influx by building Camp Eagle there. The uh, topography of the situation was such that, I'm gonna call them VC because I don't know what they were, North Vietnamese or VC. Their rocket launchers, that they could come out of the Eshaw Valley, they had to leave about sundown so they wouldn't be spotted. And they could get close enough, they could set their rockets up and set a timer, and their maximum on their timers for setting the rockets off was three hours. Now that's what I was, intelligence told us that. And then they would haul uh, back, head into the Eshaw Valley at three o'clock in the morning, their rockets would go off and they just aim for the center of the base. Well, our Helipad was the center of Camp Eagle. And we got hit pretty bad. Lost 10 aircraft that night in our hangar, our headquarters. And they had what they call back azimuth radar, which you probably heard of. As soon as radar picks up these rockets arcing in, within a count of five or 10 count, they can be putting 105 rounds back on that particular spot. Then when they'd go out and investigate, they'd find remains of the rockets, obviously, but no bodies. You know, they figured they'd set them and then 
head out. So they would try to figure, well, how long? If they said them got to be midnight, so if they head out walking, how far can they be at midnight? So that's where they would put their round in. They were partially successful with some of that. But uh, March 3rd and April the 3rd, uh, we lost an aircraft, April. For some reason, the third of the month was very uh, significant to me. On the third of the month, it, I lost six aircraft, and it all happened on the third of the month. Mar April, May, June, July, and in August. Uh, well, the last time when we landed, it was rather severe, and it broke my back. Compression fractures is what you get. Just compressed the vertebrae of my spine. I couldn't. I couldn't maneuver. A pilot pulled me out of the airplane and uh, saved my life. And you know, I've, I got a letter from him several months after that, but I've lost touch with him. I've never talked to him since. And it's kind of ironic how, I guess, in our society, somebody that was so valuable to you. And we were such good buddies because we'd flown together as a flight team for several weeks and just lost touch. I guess other priorities kick in after you get out of that environment and get back here to a safe environment. So that was it for you? <clears throat> that was it. I guess it only did six months. By the time I was medevaced through some place in Da Nang, some, I don't know, spent a few weeks there and then to Japan for three or four weeks and uh, then came back to Fort Sam Houston here. Well, back over in Vietnam though, Dave, I mean, you were a pilot. You were commander, right, of the aircraft. What kind of Huey were you flying? Cobra. Oh, you were flying a Cobra. AH-1G. Okay. It was the off-the-shelf version. See, the Army didn't have anything to do with designing the Cobra. Bell Helicopter saw the Charlie model, which they'd mounted rocket pods on. But because of its configuration, it couldn't carry all that much because it had a pilot, co-pilot, and two door gunners. Then that didn't leave a whole lot of the 4,500 pounds that a Huey would lift to carry ammo. And if you packed in enough fuel that you could get any distance, then we had to balance our fuel and our ammo load to, to whatever mission we were going on. But the Cobra was designed to be a gunship. Carried 76 rockets, had a minigun, had a turret mount in the front. You could put two miniguns or two 40 millimeters or minigun and 40 millimeter, one and one. And one. Quite impressive armament it did have. Tell me about some of the missions you flew, what your objectives <clears throat> were, and the outcome of these missions. I mean, and why you support the, the Hueys or what before they went in or what? Tell me what. 77th ARA, that's Aerial Rocket Artillery, and they used us the same way you would use artillery. They would call in a fire mission to their chain of command. Uh, it would come to us with coordinates and a radio call sign and a frequency of the ground commander to contact. And we would scramble. We had a two-minute team, two aircraft, two-minute team, a 10-minute team, and a 15-minute team. And when the two-minute team was dispatched on a mission, the five-minute team then became the two-minute. And they'd have to stay out at the aircraft, be ready to go on a moment's notice. And then the 10-minute moved up. So we could support kind of round robin with three teams, we could put fire on an area, say within 100 knots or 100, <laughs> 100 kilometers area, because a Cobra would do about 180. And it's depending on how you fly, what you were carrying. Am I rambling? No, you're doing fine. <clears throat> we had a fire team call us one day. They had a, uh, the little Hughes, they called them a hunter killer team. And he would go over in the Ashaw Valley or anywhere there was suspect activity and he would fly low and he could actually, he was only like 10 foot above the ground. And if he saw a suspicious area, a bunker complex or something, he would pop a smoke grenade and the Cobra, which was usually two or 3,000 foot higher than him, would roll in and put some rockets on the smoke. That was the target. And then the loach, he would get off to the side where he'd be out of the way where he could also observe. And they run into some trucks in the Ashaw Valley one day and they called us as a fire team for support. So we went over and expended and came back. Our two minute team that jumped in behind us, they did the same thing and back in and back out. And the Ashaw Valley where we were was also where Hamburger Hill was, 
where the Marines had such a tough time of it. And it was abandoned now, but at one time we'd had a fire base there. <clears throat> that was my first encounter with green tracers. Because our tracers were red and their tracers were green. And we had rolled in and was shooting up these trucks. And as we broke out from the side of the hill over here, those green tracers were going by maybe 20 foot in front of our aircraft. Later we found out that the Vietnamese hadn't been very successful in shooting down helicopters, so they told them, said, you have to shoot in front of it because you got to lead it. Well, <laughs> even when you're low and slow, they would always lead you, and that, that saved us that day. But there was another one of our aircraft got hit, and he was losing his oil pressure, and he fluttered off. We didn't know how far around the trucks they had a perimeter, but he'd fluttered off somewhere and just had to land. And they got out of their airplane, and the airplane either had to be destroyed or recovered. We couldn't leave it in an LZ or in an operational area because of the electronics and the ammo and the weapons because they could turn them against us. They moved away from the aircraft. Their wing ship came in, and of course, you don't have room in a Cobra to get anybody inside, but the ammo bay doors are designed to open down and we had seat belts installed. So you could get at least seat belts on one side and then they got up and got maybe half a mile away before a, a Huey medevac type ship could pick them up. And I wrote up the uh, press release on this. Uh, the young man's name that I can't remember at this time <laughs> We carried 38s sidearm. Those were our only personal weapons that we had. As they were, they landed, they ran to the other aircraft. Here come Charlie over here. They got on the ammo bay doors and they're shooting off. Well, I wrote it up as accurately as I could because I saw it. And it was rejected as being too John Wayne-ish. <laughs> I can't do anymore. The young man got put in for a silver star because he and the pilot that recovered him because they did a heck of a job. And all I did was just watch. We were wing ship that day. We were covering them, sure, but uh, as far as doing anything, we were just there. Yeah. And I'm sure our presence, the, the rotor sound from a Cobra was different than from a Huey. And Charlie could recognize this. And he hear those Cobra blades, he died because he knew we had the wherewithal to shoot back. And sometimes I think that was part of our downfall because if we had him cornered, he would shoot back. And that was uh, uh, a fallacy, I guess. I, my thinking at the time was, uh, well, if I'm going to go over there, I want to take something I can shoot back with. So that's why I went to Cobra school. And then I found out they'll shoot back at you too, and they'll shoot at you first because you got the armament. And whatever else is happening over here, if you're making an insertion, which we would support ground troops being landed at a uh, new LZ, that operation took quite a bit of planning because they would have the Air Force would come over and bomb a, hills, a hilltop where they wanted a fire base to clear all the trees off. And this would happen, and it wouldn't be just a few minutes later, 30 or 40 Hueys in a line dumping people on this LZ. And our job as Cobra support was to fly a racetrack pattern on the sides and keep suppressing fire down on the approach to the LZ and then the exit down the other side. Now we only had 4,000 rounds of minigun, 76 rockets, 220 millimeter, uh, 40 millimeter, mic, mic, they call them grenade launchers. And it didn't take us long to expend, so we'd have to have several Cobras in the racetrack pattern and as you expended your ammo, you'd go back and reload and come back and keep support on the operation until the ground commander released you. Because once he called a fire mission in, we were under his control until he released us, regardless of what happened. And if we were getting low on fuel or ammo and couldn't support him, we'd have to call for relief to come back to keep this ground commander uh, satisfy his mission, whatever that might be. <coughs> uh, <coughs> we lost a couple of ships one night during, it was a night operation somewhere close to the Eshaw Valley. And they had a flare ship 
he was up maybe 14, not 14, 12,000 foot or so. And they would kick these flares out every few minutes. And they had a little parachute and it would light up a good area. The uh, ground commander, he said he was taking fire. We never could see any muzzle flashes. We put suppressing fire in a few times around him, but it was dark, it was hard to see. And the flare ship called a SOS that one of the flares did not exit the ship. It stayed inside the ship. And then we didn't hear any more from him. Apparently he was going into an uncontrolled dive and he ran right into one of our aircraft that was below him, supporting him. And we did hear a mayday call, but we never did find anything but just a bunch of wreckage from those guys. So night operations were very difficult. It was difficult to navigate. And in an operational area, you didn't want to fly with your lights on. <laughs> Obviously, to give them a target. We were up in the DMZ one day. We were just south. We had to go up to Quang Tree once a month and pull a week duty patrol in the DMZ. And that's when they were spraying that stuff in there to kill the vegetation. I think the DMZ was five miles on either side of that river. And uh, the 5th Artillery Brigade, or whoever it was, had charge of the south part of the DMZ. They had microphones out through the DMZ on various frequencies that broadcast back to the command center. And they had a big board that could tell, they could hear human noises from these microphone things and they knew what the coordinate of that microphone was. And when they detect, detected them coming over in force, then they'd call us. We were at the Crang Tree. <laughs> it was a Marine air base there at Crang Tree. And we'd go into DMZ and shoot up whatever we, if we saw any movement or whatever. And one of the wing ships that was with us that day, he had gone in and he'd strafed the area. Well, if you start your run at 1,500 foot and you get a 30 degree dive and you go with your rockets, then you use your minigun as a, a protection, you know, to try to strafe the area you're gonna be exiting on or your 40 millimeter, whatever your exit plan is. And he laid it over way on its side. Well, it made a bigger target and he didn't go very far. And they said one of those radio control 50 caliber, radar control 50 caliber uh, quads got him, which is a big gun. Now, if they had those in the DMZ, they were planning on doing some serious stuff. And uh, I think our ship might have took some hits that day. I don't remember. Hit the battery or whatever. I had some pictures of those old things, but... Did, I, you ever, did you ever have to land or pick up wounded or anything, or you were always in the air? I mean, did you guys, in the Cobras? Well, I personally didn't. One of our wing ships did. It was quite a... Uh, we had an Air Force guy that flew a pusher-puller Cessna. You know, he had a propeller in the front, and then he had a motor in the back, pusher-puller. I forget the model that Cessna called it. But he had these big cameras on there that he told us he could count the seam on a baseball at five miles. If he takes a picture and it's focused in right, they can take it in, blow it up, and here's a baseball, and here's the stitches. And he would fly a route over through the Ashall Valley and over into Laos and around. And then a couple days later, he'd fly a similar route, and they, they could overlay those pictures and see what changes had happened in the vegetation, new roads, building, camouflage, or whatever. Well, these people were good. They were above our class. And then he would organize a mission. We'd get four Cobras and four or five of these uh, old grasshopper type helicopters with some South Vietnamese. They called them Rough Puffs, Republican Forces, Popular Forces, Rough Puffs. They're kind of like our National Guard. Mm -hmm. And they'd lay on a mission to go over and see what this new road or where it went or this camouflage area, what it was. And they'd, they'd made an insertion the month before and lost an aircraft. And a month later, we were going back in to land in a, to make an insertion. And they got a, the, the, the cancel sign was prairie fire. It was just, you heard prairie fire, you turn around and go home because something's wrong. It, they didn't have time to explain to us what it was. But anyway, it was the captain, the pilot of one of those ships that they thought was lost. And the only thing that saved his life 
when it hit, his seatbelt had burned in two and it threw him through the windshield and then the aircraft exploded. This is what intelligence told us later. And on our radios, the Vietnamese had captured enough of our radios they could monitor our frequencies. They said the aircraft's destroyed, nobody, no survivors. So they didn't go check the LZ or they would have found this guy. And about a month later, he had an idea where the next LZ insertion was going to be. And he moved at, mostly at night and slept in the trees during the day. And he got over to that next LZ and when they come to put him in, he was running out. <laughs> the only thing he had to catch attention was his map. And uh, they were able to, to pull him out. Now the guy that did it, he was on the Cobra. And the guy came up, he was so weak that they opened a, the canopy and pulled a guy in with him and then he just took right off. And when he did, because of the height of the trees around there, he lost about two foot off his rotor blade coming out of that LZ. And that, see, I witnessed things like that. But thank the Lord I never personally had to get that close to do it. Can you tell me again about your when you were injured, uh, where you were, what happened, and you mentioned, I don't know if you crash landed or just landed hard, and you, you hurt your back. Did you, hurt, did you get a head injury too, or just your back? Well, some people would tell you I had a head injury. <laughs> I don't know, Bill told me that, or something. I don't know, maybe that was something. No. That. I remember what it was, is compression fractures of the L4 and 5 and the T12 or something like that. Anyway, the lower back. Uh, so tell me where you were, what were you doing at this, on this mission? We had left Camp Eagle and was heading up to a, a fire base, Bougainville. See, the 101st Airborne was a big part of the Second World War. Well, they named their fire bases in Vietnam after battles they'd had in Europe, Bougainville, Bastogne, uh, several other fire bases over there. Yeah. And we had to follow this road up through to Bougainville, which was on the military crest on this side of the Eshaw Valley. And then over that crest and down into the Ashaw Valley. And we had to get up somewhere, what I remember, around ten or 11,000 foot just to get over that crest. And then it was a seven or 8,000 foot drop all the way down to the floor of the Ashaw Valley. And then this was a big place. It's like a big football stadium closed in. And there was aircraft wreckage in there from the Second World War that you could see and triple canopy jungle and all that stuff. Anyway, we turned around to come back and Al, that was my pilot, he said, I'm seeing something out the left side. <clears throat> and I didn't know if he meant movement or what. And then I felt something kind of like pepper, the tick, 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 tick. And he kind of fluttered off to the side and the engine quit. And it got quiet. And the rolling terrain was such he was auto-rotating. Even though we had no engine, we could still... He was auto-rotating to this kind of a mesa, and it was a pretty sharp drop. And I'm working from memory now, Larry. <laughs> and they say as you get older, there's three things you lose. The first thing that goes is your memory. I forgot the other two. But anyway, we were auto-rotating for the top of that hill, and because of weather conditions or whatever, we missed the top of the hill. Well, it was about a 30-foot drop down the other side, and when we hit, we had no rotor speed left to cushion the fall, and it just, bam. And a Cobra, the skids and the fuselage was such, you had to climb up in it. It was about standing eye level, I could look in the cockpit. Uh, I remember thinking we'd, we're going to hit and I had heard stories of the, when the rotor blade is slow, it's more flexible. It's got the centrifugal weight to keep it straight when you rotate. That they sat down so hard that the front, that the rotor blade dipped down and took off the front part of the aircraft. Well, that's where I'm sitting in the Cobra. So I ducked down as best I could to solve this. And then I realized I had a hold of this armrest up here. If that had happened, I'd have lost my arm too. But I wasn't thinking at the time, just blam, and it was such a dry, hard hit. And I sat there thinking, what, what has happened? And I remember screaming, 
but I don't remember any pain at that point. It was just, ah, this hurt. And I opened the canopy door and I looked and the ground was right here. We had bent the skids up and buried that thing in some kind of riverbed or whatever it was. And I went to get out and I couldn't move. That's, <clears throat> that's what I remember of that. Then Al, uh, Al was sitting in the back. He was pilot in command. I was co-pilot that day. I was really just ballast because we didn't have a turret that worked. Now to explain that, <laughs> The minigun was sitting out in front of the aircraft. The ammo bays were way back here. Well, to feed the ammo up to it, the motor on the gun wasn't strong enough to pull it. So they had a little transmission back here that worked off a cable. And it was the exact same as a speedometer cable on a deuce and a half that come back and turned this sprocket to feed ammo to it. We didn't have any of those cables. Mm. And we had cannibalized all the ones we had off our deuce and a halves. So that particular day, my my minigun would have fired maybe 50 rounds and then it would have jammed up or pulled a belt in two back here. So my, my uh, duty that day was pretty well useless. Seemed to me like I would just ballast so the air airplane would fly. You had to have 200 pounds in the front seat. If you made a test flight, you had to put sandbags up there if you couldn't find anybody to go with <laughs> And Al came around and uh, he was making a full shutdown, and I smelled smoke. I said, this damn thing's on fire. And he couldn't hear me because he, he still had his helmet on, and my helmet was way down here. My glasses had cut here and knocked a crystal out of my watch. And uh, I was hollering at him, get out of that airplane. We're going to have a fire. Well, then I started trying to get out, and I couldn't make it. I, was, I started pulling myself out, and I got over far enough I could get a hold of a bunch of little plants and weeds and got myself hanging up out the cockpit with them. All that gear you had to carry for your survival was, was in the way. And I pulled myself out because my legs, I could not move them. And then the pain started growing. I don't, and I don't know how much time went by. I don't remember. But I was making my way like this. And I'm thinking I need to be 300 foot from the aircraft in case it blows up for whatever reason. Fuel, ammo, cooking off. I worked at this, Larry. I worked and worked and I said, well, I'm about 300 foot. And I rolled over on my back and the rotor blade was hanging right over me. <laughs> I'd gone maybe 10 or 12 foot. And Al was still sitting in the cockpit up there and he was making a full shutdown. I said, Al, get out of there. So he come out and go running down. He said, what's the matter? I said, I can't walk, but get away from that dang airplane. It's going to blow. So he drug me out of there. Mm -hmm. And now the pain was, you know, it was, it was pretty good. But he drug me out of there and he said, you know, I don't know where we are here as far as I'm sure our wingship saw us, but it was almost sundown. And we were really where we shouldn't be at that point particular time of day we should have been out of there. But he took care of me till we got picked up. A medevac ship came in and uh, I owe that man my life and I've never been able to thank him. I think I wrote him a letter. He wrote me the letter and then I wrote him a letter back. And he was older than I. He was probably, I was at the upper age limit. 28 years old was the limit for accepting pilot training. And he'd, he'd been a pilot another six or eight years before that, so I know he would, he had quite a bit of experience and age. What were some of your targets? I mean, or do you, I mean, you said you provided support for the infantry coming in, landing, LZs. I mean, were you just shooting sporadic fire? Did you have targets? Did you see people? I mean, all of the above, or I mean, what what did you do? We had uh, designed targets. We weren't at liberty to go just shoot at whatever we wanted to. The uh, this Air Force controller, he'd lay on the mission. And we'd gone over into Laos, which we weren't supposed to do at the time. And we even signed a paper said we wouldn't talk about it. So you won't tell anybody about this. We, we had gone over to make this insertion. They were gonna, insertion is a highly organized operation. 
we would prep the area first. They'd give us corn. We're going to land our troops right here. So we would prep the entryway and the exit way and on both sides with what we had. And if we run out of ammo, we would call on our backup to come do it. We'd go reload. <clears throat> they would put these ships in and depending on the terrain, they would fly a racetrack pattern and they would be spaced out about a minute apart. The first aircraft would land, troops jump off. The other ships would fly over him and a wide several mile radius and he would take off and become the last ship and then drop them off that way. So if an observer's off over here, all he sees is aircraft circling. He doesn't not aware that there's been a landing made anywhere unless he actually sees it. That was one technique that we used. Then while they were inserting, if they were getting any fire from a particular, particular place, they would give us the coordinates from our location, ground zero, 300 meters north. And then we would put in a pair of rockets for marking. And if we got the fire for effect, then we would fire until the ground commander told us to stop. But anyway, to make a long story short, we were coming back and we hadn't put anybody in anywhere because they declared the prairie fire. So we had a full load of ammo and everything. And he said, there's an interesting area I've noticed over here that's got some extra camouflage up because he flew that area all the time and he could spot changes on the ground. So let's go over and put some rockets in and see what happens. Well, he went over and threw the smoke out, marked it. And he said, from my smoke, 50 meters all around. So we did, well, it was like stepping in an anthill. People started going everywhere. The first few rockets we put in caught the camouflage on fire and it started burning away real fast. And then there was some secondary explosions and there was some buildings in there. And we found out later that that was probably an NVA training camp of some kind that we had disturbed and they were way out of the way. I mean, it, they weren't on the regular route of, of travel. So it was just fortunate that he noticed this well, that particular day, I had my movie camera with me, Larry, it was a Super 8, and film was hard to get. And I was shooting this thing through my gun sight, because my turret was useless. Shooting my gun sight and a round come right through the front of that airplane, splattered me with plexiglass, and went on and rattled around in the back somewhere. <laughs> I can't tell you how scared I was. I was, oh, I was speechless. What happened? I didn't know, had no idea. And then there's this hole up here, and it's supposedly found out it's not bulletproof glass; it's just bullet resistant. <laughs> so I don't know what came in, but whatever it was, it came in fast enough. And I think if it had been automatic weapons fire, we'd had three or four more behind it because they fire a pretty rapid rate. But we pulled off and left because we didn't know what kind of damage we had to the aircraft. The rest of them stayed in there and expended ammo on that thing. But there was no way to get a ground commander or unit in there to find out what kind of body count we had or what kind of damage we'd done. But that Air Force controller, he said, yeah, I thought there was something down there. <laughs> he treated it kind of light. But you asked about specific targets. There was one fire base, and I'm thinking it was Bastogne, it had come under ground fire <clears throat> from, from the Ashaw Valley and they'd called in for reinforcements and support and whatever. And it was a long, I'm gonna say maybe three city blocks long on the top of this hill. And they had their artillery on this side that was, that was aimed over into the Ashaw Valley. Over on this side, they had the bunkers for their ammo. So they had, when they was gonna fire guns, they had to exit over here, they could take it out, but when they brought in ammo or fuel or anything, it come in on this side, which was supposedly the best protected side of the fire base. And the Huey come in with sling load, the load slinging underneath it. <clears throat> While he was hovering there, getting ready to drop a load, he took some ground fire and crashed right on this, on this end of the fire base. The fuel, his fuel and whatever he had in that load went down into our bunker <clears throat> and started spreading and causing big fires and mayhem. And guys on the other end had no idea what had happened. But when Charlie saw that they had been successful with this, that kind of like renewed their energy. Well, here they come. And that's when they called us in to keep the area around them suppressed. <clears throat> we saw 
we saw a few movements, but it's hard to see. We're doing 150 knots at three, 400 foot. It's hard to pick out a person on the ground or any kind of movement. And if somebody's firing at you, it looks like a strobe light. And that will catch your eye, but it, only if it's pointed pretty much straight at you. If it's off to the side, you won't be able to pick it up. We tried for three days to save that base, putting suppressing fire. They tried to bring in more people, but the, the destruction and the fires and the explosions that were still going on, because this was a massive installation. We finally ended up having to cover the excavation, e extraction of all the people off that base. And the very last thing, uh, it seemed like we did a week worth of work around that fire base until they finally decided to evacuate it. And then they had to get aircraft in. They'd have to come up this side and just creep up, load up, and then come back down this side because the other side was just too, too much uh, enemy fire coming from that side. So we only had this, this side of the air base come up and go back. And the last plane to leave it, they prepped us for this. And the last aircraft's going to be off there at 1,500 hours or something. And when they're clear, wipe it out. Just expend all your ammo. And they took off. And I was about six ships back. And the guys in the front said, yeah, Charlie's coming over the edge, you know, coming in. They realize all Americans are gone now. They're going to capture this base and they come in. But they run right into the teeth of six fully armed Cobras while they did it. And we did our racetrack pattern, fired that till we run out. Well, we were the last plane to expend. And we never really expend 100%. You always got to save something for your own protection in case something goes wrong. As we followed that Huey out, because he couldn't go very fast, we were coming up beside him. He'd bank to make a sharp turn. When he did, this red packet fell out. So I called it to his attention. He said, that's the mail. <laughs> well, all you got to say to a GI is that's the mail bag, and that gets priority because everybody loves to get mail and hear from it and either send it or come. So we tried to either destroy that mailbag or recover it, and we never did. We were unsuccessful. Did you ever feel invincible? I mean, as a pilot, I mean, do young men feel like nothing can happen to them? And, I mean, were you full of piss and vinegar, as they say, and ready to just <clears throat> do it all? I mean, does that change? Or, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yes, I do. And I observe this in some of our younger pilots. And they made good pilots, 18, 19 years old. See, I was 26, okay? I had a little bit of, I had a family, had a wife and baby, and I was kind of, I wasn't, I was mission oriented. If it needs to be done, I'll do it. But I'm not going to go in there like a bulldog and jump on something that, I, you know, unbeknownst. We had some young men that would uh, uh, take on that, I guess invincibility would be a word for it. Other, we had some over there that their main goal, they didn't care what they flew, mission or observation or just whatever. They just wanted to build time so they get their commercial license. When they go, see, we all knew there's life after this. If we make it through this, then we've got to survive and use our flying skills, hopefully, to get a good job with we'll paying an airline or petroleum helicopters or somebody like that. But I did observe that in the other boys, but I have to say I did not ever feel invincible. I knew of my infallibility. I knew that at any time, Charlie could come over the hill. And uh, the night we got hit at our base, I've got some pictures of it. It wiped out our, we had a, about a six hole outhouse out behind our hooch. <laughs> One of the jokes we'd play on the new guys, we'd wait till they all got in there. And then we'd start throwing rocks and hitting the roof and everything, holler incoming. And the boys would be outside with their movie cameras taking pictures of these new guys coming out of the outhouse thinking they were under attack. Well, we actually did get under attack. And the first night our base got hit, I, I guess I'd grown lackadaisical. Because you're supposed to sleep, be ready. I was off, though. The two-minute, ten-minute, five-minute team, they were there, but I was off for 24 hours. And a steel pot, I didn't wear one. A rifle, I didn't carry one. I had one that a guy had given me. And I was asleep, and it was about 3 o'clock, and I 
felt this gravel hitting the roof. Huh, and I raised up and looked and our hangar was on fire. It was about 150 yards from our hooch. Room. And somebody hollered, incoming, and they come in the front door and they was running down the hallway. And I said, incoming, what am I supposed to do? Uh, they told us what to do, but we'd never gone through the actual drill of it. And outside, out the back door was a, a bunker, a big bunker thing, and I was in my underwear. Steel pot, and the steel pot was in the bottom of my duffel bag. So I dumped all that out, and I was trying to get out of bed. I got a charley horse in my leg from waking up too fast or whatever, so I was halfway crippled there. I got that steel pot out, and I grabbed this rifle, and I'm hobbling down the hallway to the screen door. And the bunker's not 15 foot from there. And I'm wondering, I'm remembering the movies I've seen. Uh, artillery usually comes in three. Well, that's right. You know, artillery batteries, three guns, unless they have six. Well, I don't know how many they got. Well, this was going through my mind. I got to get in that bunker. <clears throat> and damn, they're going to laugh at me because I'm in my underwear with my steel pot. I finally gather up my nerves, charge out the door, around, down in the bunker. And there's two captains sitting in there with their mattresses pulled over them, and they ain't got no clothes on. They were in the next hooch down there. So I ended up laughing at them. <laughs> but that was probably the feeling like you don't have any control. It's going to come, and it's coming, and I can't do nothing to stop it. What can I do to protect myself? That was probably my biggest concern, but I never did get a feeling of infallibility or, yeah, gung-ho, let's go again. We had a CO that took care of all that because he, he designed a plan one day. We had, there was A, B, and C batteries of the 77th ARA. <clears throat> and between us, we had 36 aircraft. We had to have uh, six, two, four, each battery had to have six aircraft flyable every day. Well, we had 12. So you could have six in maintenance and six on the flight line. He pulled together every ship in our battery. And we're going to, the Eshaw Valley, like I told you, is about long like a football field. We're going to go in the Eshaw Valley, 36 ships wide. And we're going to go down with many guns and rockets blazing, come up the other side, do a hammerhead turn, come back down the other side, and we're going to wipe out everything in the Eshaw Valley. Well, there was a lot of trepidation about that. And uh, I don't know that we did anything other than just made a lot of noise. But see, the, the fiscal year for the Army ends June 30th. June 30th, July 1st, around to June 30th was the Army or the government fiscal year. We'd run out of money. Our battalion got so much budget to buy rockets and minigun rounds and whatever. And uh, towards the end of April and middle of May, we'd expended our ammo budget. And a lot of times we went out during that period with just uh, enough ammo for our own self-protection. Mm -hmm. And thankfully there wasn't a lot of activity. And they were expecting a big Tet offensive, and I don't remember the date that Tet occurred. 67 was the big year for Tet, if I remember right. And this was uh, 70. So they were saying that Huey and Fubai and Da Nang, we were supposed to be the protection force for those three cities. And uh, we sat around and waited, and there was never a big Tet offensive that I knew of in 1970. And it wasn't too long after that that down south they decided to go into Cambodia. And that took a lot of our resources. And replacement pilots were going there. Uh, what spare ammo they had was going there, and we were just on a kind of a maintenance schedule there. Let me ask you some follow-up questions. We're getting near <clears throat> the tape, and I need to ask you these questions. I ask all the veterans this, but uh, Dave, as a veteran, what does freedom mean to you? Freedom means the ability to laugh when you're happy, to cry when you're sad, to swat a mosquito or a, a gnat, uh, to eat when you're hungry, to sleep when you're sleepy. And the POWs that I have met that I asked that similar question to were denied those basic, very basic, basic freedoms. And we don't realize it, but uh, I can't remember the young man's name. 
he spent several years in a Vietnam prison. When I came back, I worked with some of these. And he said, if you laughed or if you cried or if you complained or swatted a fly without permission, that you would get punishment, whatever that was. And the freedoms that we enjoy today, see, what the Americans don't realize, we're at war. We are at war. Fortunately, our two oceans have protected us from having to put up with hostile forces on our territory. But I spent time in Germany with civilians. I lived on the economy while I was in the Army. And their concept of we are so glad, so happy that we are free and have this freedom. We went through, I can remember, I was just an infant in the Second World War, but I was about five years old when it ended. I can remember the ration lines. See, we haven't had any of that. Uh, fortunately, we're a very wealthy nation and we can support a war and keep our civilian population happy too. But if our civilian population had to go through what the Germans, the French, the Dutch, and everything went through in the Second World War, with their home country being occupied by tyrants and people mistreating them, permission not to be out after dark. You can't just get in your car and go down to 7-Eleven whenever you want to under those conditions. I don't know that Americans appreciate it. They demand it as a right. Well, I appreciate it as a freedom that I can, if I don't like where I'm working, I can leave. But just the basic freedoms, like you asked, Larry, that's, that is freedom because when a, one civilization or one political group oppresses another and says, you can't do this, 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 that is really a deprivation of freedom. Tell me about the price for freedom, the cost of freedom. If you could tell a young person today or try to communicate that to them, what would you tell them about the price for our freedoms? <clears throat> you know, I think our countries are like a neighborhood when you got a neighborhood bully and you got his henchman. And every time you go out your front gate, he's out there to hassle you, to take away your grocery money, to take away your allowance money or whatever. And your only recourse is to go tell your mom or dad or something. And then when they come back, he's gone. The The price of freedom, it does. I don't believe there's a price tag on it. It's, it's a commitment that you have to make to stay free. And to stay free in our society, you have to obey the laws. You have to be a good citizen. Because if you upset and react and do things you're not supposed to do, we'll put you in jail. So it starts with your basic freedoms. That's, and I'm certainly not a, a learned scholar that I can tell you. I'm just telling you my observations and my views. But... Uh, to be free politically is a freedom that may be different from the neighborhood bully type freedom. But anybody that's got anything nice, there's always somebody going to try to take it away from you. And we have that element in our society. And we have countries that are that way. They were willing to use industrial espionage. Uh, copyright infringement, whatever they need to take what we have and then criticize us. Oh, you bourgeois Americans or capitalists or whatever. If it wasn't for the Americans, most people in the world would be speaking German or Japanese today and maybe Italian. I don't know how long they, they would have stuck with the thing or what part of the world they would have got. But uh, the Australians, the English, and the Americans, if those three countries had not banded together among others, in the Second World War, to preserve what we have today. That, I hate to generalize and say most Americans, no Americans in my generation have experienced war. We've heard of the war going on in Korea, Vietnam, and whatever, but it's never touched our lives into where we had to have blackouts at night. Or we didn't have food because somebody intercepted the food train going to Sam's. That that is so terrifying. And fortunately, the people of European countries and the other countries that have experienced that have found the fortitude to come through it. And they would be the ones to ask, what is the price of freedom? I can't tell you. I've been free all my life. So I don't really know what I've paid for it. I know what other people have gone through to guarantee it. And I can appreciate that very much. 
Tell me about the American flag. What does that mean and represent to you as a, as a veteran? It's the greatest emblem, symbol in the world. When I was waiting to be medevaced, and I heard this whop, 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 and I looked up and there was an American flag on the bottom of that Huey, I cried. I still get goosebumps when I hear the national anthem. It never fails to move me. And just thinking about it now, it's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, the flag itself doesn't have any power. It's just a bunch of stuff that Betsy Ross designed and put together and said, here's the flag. But it moves me as an individual. When I see the American flag desiccated and trampled on by people, the only thing I can do is pray for their ignorance because that's what it is. If you can't appreciate the country, the symbol of the country that's given you the freedom and the power to do what you do, then you have no gratitude at all to trample on the flag, to burn the flag. Oh, sure, all you've done is burn a piece of cloth, but what that cloth stands for. And I'll defend forever your right to do what you want to with it because I'm an American. And I've thought about this too. I would go back to combat duty if called upon, if needed, yes, sir. I would do it. But I don't want, I want my children and my friends and children to respect the flag and give it the respect that our country deserves. It's like the office of the president. You may not particularly agree with the man that's in office now, but you cannot disrespect the office. And it's got to be the most powerful position in the world, or we're just we're just secondary citizens. We ought to be proud that we're leading the world. We've led them into space. We've led them into the bottom of the ocean. We've led most of the arms and improvements that are made in the world today, in televisions, were American ideas. And most of them came from immigrants. <laughs> so I don't, did that answer your question? That was very well done, yeah. What, have you ever been back to the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C.? No, I haven't. Any desire to see it or? Yeah, I was a good friend of mine from our hometown, a Silver Star recipient. He was a medic, medic and uh, his name was Larry Kellogg. He won the Silver Star for his action in Vietnam. He told me that for him that was one of the most moving experiences. And he'd had, he'd had complications since then, but he said that really cleared it up for him. And I know a lot of my friends' names are on that wall. I went back to Fort Walters, Texas, which is now just, it's a prison. <laughs> the barracks I used to live in is a prison. And I almost got picked up for going in there because there wasn't any signs that said you can't come in. And I was showing my wife. I said, this is where we went to flat school. And this guard pulled me over. I went back to Fort Rucker. They had the aircraft museum there. Uh, there was quite a few names from a warrant officer candidate class of 69, 35. And I'm just thankful I made it back. And those, uh, the, one of the guys from our class was one of the first killed going into Cambodia. And I can't remember his name. His father was a, was a senator or congressman from Hawaii. And he was in the lead Cobra going into Cambodia and got raped almost the very first hour of that incursion. That, man, what can I say? There, for the grace of God, go I. But what we're doing today and in our armed forces and everything is a team effort. The, the Army is not the reason the United States is screwed up. The political, uh, executive, legislative, and judicial, none of those branches are responsible for what we're doing. It's a team effort. And the input that goes into Washington, people may not realize it, but all. You, you write your senator or congressman a letter, it goes in a, he may not read it personally, but it's either for or against or whatever, it goes in that column. And our grassroots effort is what, what starts these things. And Lyndon B. Johnson, John F. Kennedy, all presidents, I may not have agreed with their political views 100%, but I respect their office 100%. Because that's my office. I'll never be in there, I'll never sit in that chair. But the man that's in there has to have the support and the respect of the American people for him to be functional.
just about out of time. Dave, what should the American public remember about Vietnam? Well, <clears throat> it was Second World War technology trying to fight a guerrilla warfare. We had the tanks and the things we had from the Second World War in Korea, that ground type offensive where you're capturing territory and capturing territory, was not what we were doing in Vietnam. And the territory we captured during the day, we gave it back during the night and then we have to go back and fight for it, isn't it? Uh, we were just trying to keep, a, this is very simplistic. We were trying to keep South Vietnam homogenous and keep them out. Had we been aggressors, we'd have gone in and wiped them out. We had the capability of doing it, but we didn't have world opinion on our side. But it's always dangerous. We have allies, and they protect us and we protect them. That's the purpose of these peace treaties, I guess. But I'm, I'm certainly not of a strong enough political knowledge or bent that I could even uh, offer anybody any advice that would be educated enough to, to keep from sounding like a redneck. You know? Are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? I'm very proud of my military service. It was forced on me. I was drafted. I had a good uh, friend that was the Army recruiting sergeant. He guided me and said, here's what you need to do to stay out of Vietnam. And I enlisted and went to Europe. My first wife was from Finland. Did, per did perfectly until I started getting the desire for more education in advance in this army and I went through flight school and did that. And then that didn't work out because I've never flown since. I've met a couple of the guys that worked for PHI that I'd known before and most helicopter pilots in the world. I saw one in Nigeria a while back. I said, what walk class was you? And he gave it to me. <laughs> so you could spot them. But I'm very proud of my military service and I would recommend it as a career thing for most young people, not everybody, but for every soldier you have on the front line, it takes six men supporting him. Payroll, food, supply, intelligence, the whole thing. So when we had 500,000 troops in Vietnam, we probably had less than 100,000 actually out carrying guns and doing the fight, and the rest were for support. And uh, support place ain't a bad place to be. <laughs> Real quick, what would you say to a Vietnam vet today that might be watching this? I would thank him very much for his service, and I'm glad he came back. In fact, I met one just a while ago, and I'm glad he came back because that's when you get off that airplane over there, you had no idea what you're going into, what you're going through. It's all new. It's not like your seven-year-old going to, going to school the first day. You know he's going to be there when you pick him up when he comes out. We had no idea. I had, I had absolutely no idea. I was the most naive person, I believe. Going in there, what's expected of me, uh, I knew my departure date, because they'd tell you, well, we'll send you home on this date if you make it that long. We had probably, while I was there, we lost maybe five or six pilots. Uh, crashes, shot down, just. See, we were running that old Aradmac engine some of the other guys you have in may talk to you about that. But the Pratt & Whitney Dash 13 jet engine, good engine. After it gets so many hours on it, they send it back to Corpus Christi to refurbish it. And it'd come back to us 800 hours. And you could almost set your watch by it quitting. Because that would just... <clears throat> we were fighting the war on a budget, just like we're trying to do in this war here now. Well, we spent so many billions, so many billions, so many billions. And, but that's what it all comes back to is the money. What's it gonna cost? And a lot of people revolt at that, but you can't put a price on the freedom that we have. It's, it's here, it doesn't have a price in money. And you pay the village bully to keep bullying you, to quit bullying you. Yeah. At the end of my interviews, I always have the veteran give me a salute into the camera. From where you're seated, when I ask you, can you do that? Sure. Just give me a second, okay. Right into the camera, Dave, go ahead. Excellent. Okay. Yes.